meeting since St. John Baptist Medesal. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us and welcome to the Seabird Lecture Developing the Scholar Practitioner co-sponsored by the Center for Business Research and Development and the Management and Organization Department. I am Patrick Aure, Research and Administrative Assistant for Seabird, your Master of Ceremonies for the day. To start things right, let us first rise for the opening prayer to be led by Mr. Mark Andrea Mani, Lecturer from the Financial Management Department. After the prayer, please come standing for the Philippine National Anthem. Let us remember that we are in the presence of our God, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we come before you today to give you honor and praise. You are worthy of all our praises. Lord, you are the source of all that is good. You are the source of all of our blessings. And thank you for every gift that we have been given. We thank you for the opportunity to come and gather together this day. Thank you for bringing our lecturer, our administrators, guests, and students in this place. We ask for your hand of blessing on this public lecture. We ask that you would guide and direct this activity so that it is full of wisdom and productivity. Lord, we know that we will not come out of this place empty-handed because of the knowledge that we will acquire today. Please be with us all throughout the afternoon. Our Lasallian prayer. Saint John Baptist de la Salle. The Jesus in our hearts. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us remain standing for our national anthem. Research University 
enriching faith and scholarship in the service of society, especially the poor. So well, we hope that you will learn a lot from uh, this lecture this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Haberadas. Before we proceed to the program, may I request Dr. David Coughlin and Dr. Santa Maria to please go to your designated seat, seats on stage. Today is indeed a great day as our guest professor will deliver a very special lecture for all of us. However, before we proceed to the main part of the program, I would like to call on Dr. Benito L. Dihamki, the Chair of the Management and Organization Department, to formally introduce my speech. Good afternoon, everyone. It will be my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this afternoon. In around 2002, the former Dean of the Graduate School of Business, Dean Philip Wico, whom uh, some of you may know was uh, the youngest cabinet member during the Cory Aquino presidency, uh, he held the portfolio for agrarian reform. He gave us this message as we administrators in the Graduate School of Business gathered during one meeting to plan the future of our MBA programs and our doctoral programs. He said, and his message rings in my ear even now, we must be careful not to produce business leaders who have their feet firmly planted in mid-air. This was his favorite expression. So every time we want to propose uh, a topic for a seminar, well, yes, so who, who will actually use that? And of course, every time he would say, uh, people who have their feet firm, firmly planted in midair, I would almost notice him looking at me, but maybe that was my defensiveness. But that made a very deep impression on us during those early years of the uh, 2000s. Because you will remember, this was around the same time that the Enron uh, implosion happened, which threw the entire world into turmoil because we learned the hard way that companies were not being governed very well. It was also around this time that a lot of criticism was leveled at business education as being disconnected from reality, which is an extension of the ivory tower uh, criticism of universities. So MBAs were called management by analysis. They're good at analyzing, but they cannot actually do anything. One author said MBA stands for moral bankruptcy assured. Well, they can do things, but they cannot tell you whether what they're doing is actually the right thing. Around this time, uh, Jeffrey Pfeffer uh, of the Graduate School of Business of Stanford University and Robert Sutton came out with a book which became very popular. They titled the book, The Knowing Doing Gap. The Knowing Doing Gap, which was subtitled, How Smart Companies Turn Knowledge into Action. Now, this was around 2000, and it's an interesting book, and I recommend our students to read it. But three of the things that uh, Pepper and Sutton emphasized in that book was that a lot of times business leaders couldn't actually do anything when they go through business schools because they miss out on the following points. The first point is, and this is something our speaker always emphasizes when we have conversations with him, doing something requires actually doing something. So the important thing is to do something, not just to talk about doing something. Now, maybe if you don't learn anything else from the talk, I hope that one sticks to your mind. And number two, according to Pfeffer and Sutton, doing means learning. And learning means making mistakes. And we know that schools have made students pathologically afraid of making mistakes which practically paralyzes them. It paralyzes them in class. So when you ask for discussion in class, all the students look at their shoes. And then after you assure them that yes, your shoes, your shoes are still there, you can now participate, then they look at their neighbor's shoes. So this, this kind of, of fear of failing 
is one of the unintended consequences of an educational system that always emphasizes do things only when you're sure. And the third point that Pfeffer and Sutton emphasize in their book, The Knowing Doing Gap, is that knowing and doing are part of the same thing. Now, these two authors wrote this book in 2000, and when I was reading it, what occurred to me is that our speaker, Dr. Coughlin, had said this more than 10 years before this book came out, that knowing and doing is part of the same thing, and learning is about making mistakes and moving forward. And so we were very happy. I emailed him and I said, Father, could you come over to this part of the world? He had never visited this part of the world prior to receiving that email invitation. And being the jolly, brave person that he is, he's here. And therefore, it's my pleasure to present him to you. You all have the program, so I will not read through his credentials. It's all in the program. But let me just make a few personal observations about Father in the brief period that I have known him. Father is always emphasizing starting small. Don't be too ambitious. And I think this is related to one key principle that he emphasizes with us, is that doing things doesn't have to be stressful. And I think all of us in administration can learn from that simple advice. So administrators, you can line up for counseling later on stress management. And for me, the most important message he always says is, work together. Whatever you're already doing is part of action research. And he ends with this repeated advice, just do it. Work together and just do it. So friends, join me in welcoming our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. David Coughlin. and who publishes their clinical work. 
It has also existed in education administration, in law, and in many of the other professions. Not so much in management. One may find it in acting, and in the actor-director context, where eminent practitioners demonstrate their skills and underlying theory and use in master classes. And I was thinking as I was putting this paper together of a program I saw on British television, it could be 10 years ago now, of Michael Caine giving a master class on acting. And boy, was it a master class. He had an audience of budding actors and he showed them how to use facial expressions, whether you're on the stage, and a different way of using exp facial expressions if you're in front of a camera. So not only was he training them, showing them technique, but he was showing that he was a master of a craft that he had thought about, reflected on, and was passing on to his students. In 2009, I managed to persuade the editors of the, applied, the Journal of the Applied Behavioral Science to allow me to co-edit a special issue of that journal to celebrate the 80th birthday of Edgar Schein, an eminent organizational psychologist. And they agreed, after the usual kind of toing and froing. And because Edgar Schein's work covers a wide range of fields. I mean, his book on organizational culture is the seminal research and work in the field. Similarly, his work on process consultation, on careers, and so on. He's covered a wide range of areas in his life, in his long life. So I had been a student in MIT, so I wrote to him and said, of all the things that you've written about, that you've explored, we're doing this special issue, what do you think is the one you'd like to see focused on more? And he wrote back and said, my work as a scholar practitioner, which is what we did, and he wrote about that in that journal. So I'm picking a particular focus of the scholar practitioner. In other words, the scholar practitioners who engage in the scholarship of practice in their own organizations. And that has not received much attention. As I say, we have uh, scholar practitioner literature in medicine and law and the other professions. But where someone is part of their own organization, as a manager, for example, or an administrator in their own organization. <coughs> because implicit in such engagement is that scholar practitioners do not learn as detached observers, but rather engage as actors in the management of change in their own organization and system that they inquire into that, and that inquiry is intricately linked to action. So I'm going to talk about that. So I want to talk about, about being a scholar practitioner as pursuing practical knowing. I'll talk about the work of scholar practitioners in terms of an integrated framework, and then I'll talk, point to some issues about quality. So let me say, take my first point about practical knowing. The world of the scholar practitioner is the world of practical knowing and action. Now, a funny thing happened to practical knowing, probably in the 17th century, and it essentially got excluded from the academy with the emergence of science in the post-Descartes Newtonian era. And even today, we see what it's like in the Philippines, but certainly in parts of the world that I wander around in, schools or colleges that focus on action are seen as second rate, second tier institutions. There are trade schools or colleges of technology, things like that. But universities, no, no, they have a different type of aura altogether. But practical knowings, concerns, and interests are human living and the successful performance of daily tasks and of discovering solutions, immediate solutions that work. Practical knowing has its own characteristics that
that differs it from scientific knowing. Practical knowing from varies from situation to situation and from place to place. So that what is familiar and works in one setting won't work in another. Every situation we're in, we have to adapt. We say to ourselves, what's going on here? Who's here? How do I talk to them? How do I work out what needs to work? And you adapt accordingly. So practical knowing is always incomplete and can only be completed by figuring out what is needed in situations one is at a particular time. So we're here today. This is the first time this has ever happened. This is now. It's in the present. So I have to figure out what works as I'm standing here today. If we were to come back in two weeks' time, it would be different. Even if we were all the same, exact same people sitting in the same seats, it would be different. Why? Because we'd have all changed in some way. Things would have happened, we'd remember differently, and so on. So once a situation has passed, then practical knowing reverts to its incompleteness. As no two situations are identical, scholar practitioners have to reason, reflect, and judge in a practical manner of knowing in order to move from one setting to another, grasping what modifies, modifications are needed and deciding what behavior is appropriate. So the word of the scholar practitioner is a word of practical knowing that builds on the past, takes place in the present, and is trying to create the future. Of course, managers don't learn as detached observers, but they engage as actors in the management of their systems. As Red Reference once put it, Management is an action-oriented trade. As insiders in their own organization, managers are close to the situation and to the people engaged in them, and they're part of what takes place. Accordingly, they need methods to enable them to both engage with and make sense of what goes on inside themselves as they work to deal with what's going on around them. In a classic article in the early 1980s, Everett and Lewis referred to such challenges of inquiry from the inside as groping in the dark, into hidden organizational realities around them, in many directions simultaneously as multi-sensory holistic immersion, and as messy iterative groping. The question arises then as to how the field of management learning and education can prepare and enable managers to inquire into what Everett and Lewis referred to as the blooming, buzzy confusion of their organizational system. And of course, as an aside, I could then uh, refer you to the work of the various so sociologists such as Bloomer, Goffman's notion of backstage. John Van Manen's work and so on. Schoen refers to being inside an organization as being in the swampy lowlands. Which is very different from being on a high ground looking down from outside. So, the context of the insider practitioner, of the scholar practitioner, is the strategic and operational setting that organizational members confront in their working lives. So issues of organizational concern, such as system improvement, organizational learning, the management of change, the red and hot issues, and so on, are suitable subjects for insider inquiry by scholar practitioners, since they A, are real events and have to be managed in real time, and B, they provide opportunities for both effective action and learning, and C, they can contribute to the development of actionable knowledge that is ground in what really goes on in organizations. Because sometimes external research does not get at what's really going on in organizations. And we are all aware of the classic story of the researcher interviewing the manager. The manager says, well, which do you want? The real story or the official story? And they say, we want the real story. And the manager says, okay, turn off the tape recorders. And because they were bound by their 
the university in terms of the, the requirements of their quality of research methods to bring back tapes and numbers to have accurate transcripts, they left their tape recorders on with the obvious inference as to the quality of the knowledge that they received. Sean points out that managers do reflect in action, but they typically don't reflect on their reflection in action. I suppose that's what we're talking about today. For knowledge to be realized, first, managers need to attend to how they attend to experience, and what gives them curiosity, delight, anxiety, and so on. Secondly, they need to revert to their intelligence, what it is that they do not understand yet. The dissatisfaction with current explanations, the puzzled search for new understanding, the release when they receive insights and their effort to express what they have understood. Thirdly, they need to attend to their own reasonableness, whether their understanding fits the evidence, whether it is coherent or true, whether something would work or not. They need to attend to the values and responsibilities of, of action, so they can move from one question to another in a conscious and dynamic manner. Each process has engaged them in self-reflection, collaboration with others, and consolidated learning. So elsewhere I've put this together in terms of a general empirical method that basically says, be attentive to the data, be intelligent in your understanding, be reasonable in your judging, and be responsible for your actions. So that's my first point really about practical knowing. Second point then really is about an integrated framework, and this has emerged through the field of action research over the last 15 or 20 years or so. So I'm saying working in this manner, scholar practitioners engage in three forms of practice or engagement. And these are often framed as first, second, and third person practice. These three inquiries and practices capture how an individual's inquiry and learning is implemented in collaboration with others and then that both lead to an articulation of learning that can be brought to other settings. First person inquiry, practice, is typically characterized as the forms of inquiry and practice that develops the ability of the individual to foster an inquiring approach in his or her own life. It fosters engaging in self-learning in action, learning to reflect in deep inquiry about themselves their assumptions, their practices, their values, their ethics, how they grapple with the understanding of their organizations, how they attempt to act justly and ethically. As insider inquiry by scholar practitioners takes place in the present tense, reflexivity therefore plays a central role. To be reflexive, as you know, is to have an ongoing conversation about experience by continuously living in the moment. We would talk about reflection in action as a development of reflection on action or reflection after action. And sometimes we can do that. Sometimes it's after a meeting or it's after a class and we say, what on earth is going on there? So we reflect and process it. The skill, of course, is to be able to reflect while the action is happening. So if something needs to be changed, you may say something, change the direction of a meeting or of an event. Why? Because you're aware of what's going on how it's getting slow, or whatever it might be. Reflexivity becomes a continuing mode of self-analysis and political awareness. As their organizational interventions unfold, managers may develop reflexive inquiry into their own values, assumptions, and behaviors, and into hidden, taken for granted assumptions that guide behavior in organizations. Yet this desire to lead change in one's own organization requires a combination of self-reflection with vulnerability, realistic expectations, tolerance, humility, self-giving, self-containment, and ability to learn. Therefore, first-person reflexivity is an essential element for scholars and practitioners engaging in their insider environment. Second-person practice addresses the ability to build collaborative relationships so as to inquire into and work with others on issues of mutual concern. 
through face-to-face -face dialogue, conversation, and joint action. It occurs as managers lead and collaborate with multiple stakeholders, for, for example, their own management teams, project teams, their boards, external organization development consultants, and so on. Such conversations, however, need to be reflective, and they require participation to take a higher viewpoint, seeking insights into the whole situation rather than constituent parts, and into the forms of conversation required in order that learning may take place. We go to lots of meetings, and we plow through agendas, but we never stop to think about what we're doing. Third-person practice aims at generalizing or extending the learning to other settings or audiences, and in effect, seeking to articulate what is actual knowledge. So you successfully complete a project. So what? What have you got to say to other people who might have similar types of projects? What are you learning from that that you can bring to other projects you may be engaging in in a month's time? So the collaborative, the actionable knowledge, the work of scholar practitioners, while it occurs in the present tense, as they work hard to change their organizations, seeking to be successful in the change endeavors and to generate actionable knowledge, so it involves three interdependent processes. They're learning about self through the action, their collaborative work with others, and the generation of learning that is robust for scholars and useful for practice. Insider scholar practitioners' third person practice flows from the work at first and second person and constitutes the contribution that the research makes to an impersonal audience to dissemination of robust and actionable knowledge. And here, the challenge is to confront the general bias that may exist between those who opt for the bus theory to the exclusion of relevant or action and those who seek actionability without rigor. I'm confronting the common discourse that says you can't have rigor and relevance, but they're polar opposites. And if, any, if you go for relevance, then you trade off against rigor. If you go for rigor, you're trading off against relevance. I'm challenging that very strongly. The integration of first, second, and third person practice provides the basis for rigor and quality. So, what do we mean by quality in this sense? This is my third point. Passmore, Bill Passmore, D. Woodman, Gene Simmons, not Gene Simmons, Helen Simmons, Gene Simmons is some else, right? Postulate that research needs to be rigorous, reflective, and relevant. Under rigorous, they group that is data driven, draws on multiple methodologies, is reliable across settings, is co evaluation, causality, underlying mechanisms, is publishable. Under reflective, they group the historical impact, referential, co-interpretation, embedded in a community of practice, and collected and repeated application. Under relevant, they group practical, co-determined, reapplicable, teachable, face valid, interesting, true significance, and specific. So this paper is proposing that these three quality standards have been rigorous reflective and relevant provide a useful and critical benchmark for both undertaking and assessing insight or inquiry by scholar practitioners. So to tease that out a little bit. First and second person inquiry and practice may demonstrate being rigorous, reflective and relevant. Being rigorous, reflective and relevant in first person practice involves attention to experience and to how experience is processed and understood. Scholar practitioners may not attend to their experience all the time. They may ignore what is disturbing or uncomfortable. Their interpretation of events may be superficial, inaccurate, and biased. Their judgments may be flawed. As Chris Archers has been telling us for about 50 years, they may act on untested inferences and attributions. And as the Psychodynamic people have been telling this for even longer. 
They may have unconscious fears which censor or block or divert questioning. And we know from the anthropologists that as members of groups, they can be blind to the limitations of their culture, their race, their gender, and how power operates. Yet, we can learn. We can discover our mistakes. Scholar practitioners can inquire into the source of their misunderstandings, their biases, their inferences, their prejudices, their fears, their anxieties, and false judgments. How they subvert the inquiry process by ignoring awkward questions, or not attending to all the data, or jumping to conclusions. They can gain insight into these thoughts to knowing by enacting the general empirical method that I've referred to, through pursuing, pursuing a desire to know what is rather than what they want to be. The act of judgment enables critical reflection on insights and so enables the distinction between what they affirm by judgment and what are merely assumptions, emotional reason, reasoning, wild claims, and jumping to conclusions. Being rigorous, reflective, and relevant in second person practice, focus on the quality of collaborative inquiry and action with colleagues and relevant others. Shine refers to two ways of talking together. There is a traditional discussion mode where the emphasis is on advocacy, competing, and convincing what we refer to as this, the debate mode, the Socratic method. Here, the dialogue of exploring opposites predominates through debate. Secondly, there is the mode of dialogue, which is marked by suspending one's own presuppositions and engaging in internal listening, accepting differences, and building mutual trust. This involves revealing feelings building common ground and challenging one's own assumptions and learning to think and feel that the whole group may build new and shared assumptions. In Shine's view, if new organizational responses are needed to change cultural assumptions or to learn across subcultural boundaries, this mode of dialogue will be the most important. This is because organizational learning involves going beyond the cultural status quo. Being rigorous, reflective, and relevant in third-person practice captures how actionable knowledge is generated through the demonstration of how inquiry is data-driven, explored, tested, and evaluated in a collaborative and reflective manner. So then my final point, which really implications for the education and development of scholar practitioners. I'm proposing two implications for the education and development of scholar practitioners. First, it suggests that an executive education and development orientation, which integrates the intense engagement of the individual scholar practitioner with endeavors to change or improve organizational performance. It demonstrates how the framework of first, second, and third person practice is useful in capturing the range of experiences and challenges that insiders face as they work to develop and lead change in their own organizations. Engaging in the messy iterative groping in their organizational systems demands that scholar practitioners have both methods and skills that enable them to do it in first, second, and third person practice in a rigorous, reflective, and relevant manner. Such programs for senior managers, administrators, or leaders from different sectors would enrich cross-disciplinarity and enhance the offerings that a university provides for the world of practice that very often is alienated from the world of the scholar. Secondly, it provides a rich forum for research, both in terms of the output of the scholar practitioner and in terms of the rich narrative of rigorous, reflective and relevant engagement in the scholarship of practice that can enhance our understanding of how it works and contribute to the sparse enough literature on this subject. So it provides an opportunity for faculty to engage in collaborative research, mode two research, learning history, and so on. So in conclusion then, I've adopted the position in this paper that the scholar practitioners are not merely practitioners who do research, but rather that they integrate scholarship in their practice and generate actionable knowledge that is, knowledge that is robust for the scholar and actionable for the practitioner. 
So I have explored how the work of scholar practitioners cannot be explored without considering the scholar practitioners themselves, how they attend to and learn about themselves in action, how they build and enact, enact collaborative relationships with others, and how actionable knowledge is generated. From this perspective of the scholarship of practice, a methodology and methods of inquiry, the three practices of first, second, and third person can meet the requirements of being rigorous, reflective, and relevant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kochner, for your lecture. Let's now please welcome Dr. Madeline Santa Maria, the Director of the University Research Coordination Office, our discussion for today's activity. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Father David, for such a very simple but complicated lecture. I got lost somewhere in the middle. It is simple because it brings, it gives a very clear, simple message. It is complicated because the, the, the goal to which uh, Father David is advocating is a complicated process. So um, there are certain issues that I have noted down and that has to do with how do we produce knowledge through action? And what is the nature of knowledge uh, that is produced by action and through action? Uh, I want to begin with uh, two stories that happened in my own career as a university research coordinator and as a member of the faculty of the Department of Psychology. About three weeks ago, in a departmental meeting, the, the faculty members were suggesting in the university, for those who are not part of the university, we have this strong advocacy for extension, for community outreach. So one of the plans that the faculty members were uh, deciding to do was to uh, bring the students to the different universities in the university belt where the phenomenon of bullying was very rampant. And we know that from my research, I know that, and the university administrations are usually very helpless about it. And the, the, the issue has been brought to the Psychology Association of the Philippines, and we are now responding to that particular call, and each of the departments were asked what to do. So we decided to have that as our, our extension project. And one, uh, one, one uh, very strong recommendation was to bring our students and lecture about bullying. So because of my, my uh, talking to Father David, of course, that very, uh, <laughs> that very meaningful encounter at my office, truly, I said, wait a minute, we're going to teach the people about bullying and we think we understand what their experience is. Of course, I think the department and we think you become, a, you become an antagonist and you antagonize everybody who's all, everybody's really very gung-ho about, let's bring the students there and tell them have the skill. Then we, I said, I tried to explain, do we understand their experience? Will we solve the problem? No. What is it going to be of use? Will our students understand bullying even more after that encounter? So those are the questions that we ask when we talk about this kind of knowledge that we want our students to have. Another recent, most recent experience was last night. We had a meeting, a research team multidisciplinary research team met about how we would go about presenting our research plan, research project plan, to a community in Palawan because we would want to be able to collaborate with them on a uh, nature-based tourism project because we don't like Coron to be another for our 
So we were, we had the model, plenty of colors, and then, but it was a very interesting experience, talking about reflection. It was a very interesting experience because we were looking at the model that we knew what we would face on the ground. We were going to Palawan on August 3 to meet with those we would like to collaborate with because it's action research, uh, action research. And then we anticipated how we are going to be uh, what's this, dealing and collaborating and interacting with the people who were in Palawan, knew Palawan, and understood the, the ecological ecosystem and the problems associated with the ecosystem of tourism in Palawan. And our title of the project is Towards a Sustainable Model of Ecotourism in Palawan. So we found ourselves towards the end of the meeting, about, three, well, about an hour of discussion, we found ourselves totally humbled by the realization about our title. How dare we talk about a sustainable ecotourism model when there must be efforts to protect the ecosystem already in Palawan. The very act, the very decision that we change this whole title, documenting the ecosystem sustainable, this is ecosystem, documenting the successful nature-based tourism models in Palawan. And that, and I, I, I told the, the, the persons there, this is truly interdisciplinary. We have humbled ourselves because of that discussion that we had. So uh, with those two uh, experiences, I go back to the issues that I have reflected on. I did prepare a little bit about this, but I, my preparation doesn't mean anything right now. After I read, I listened to uh, Father David, when um, Ben asks, Dr. Ben Tehaki says, doing the right thing, starting small, uh, doing an action, we are actually talking about a certain type of scholarship and what uh, Father David calls a scholarship of practice. I ask myself then, do we are now, if we reflect very deeply about this scholarship of practice, this producing knowledge through action, shouldn't we reorient and re-examine our goals for teaching and our goals for doing research? What are the possible educational implications? Father David enumerated some in his concluding remarks. And what are the possible implications to research? One of the things that I saw are what possible implications there are would be the whole idea of teaching our students and also starting with the research practice with practical knowing. When you bring the students and give them knowledge, what is the practical knowledge that can, they can derive? Do they know the context? When we do research, do we know the context? If we go to Palawan, are we going to Palawan, stay there, feel the context? Okay. Another is inquiry in collaboration. Um, another skill is inquiry in collaboration. So here, we teach the students how to ask questions, how to inquire, but in collaboration. How do we do that? And how do we practice that among ourselves and with our students? Another uh, skill is what uh, Father David called reflection, awareness of what is going on. Are students aware of their own learning experiences in the classroom? I agree with Ben. Every time I ask the question, I ask the question, nobody starts to answer. Even if my question was as easy as hell, they don't want. They're afraid to make a mistake. I said, I keep telling them, making the, making a mistake is better than, than giving me what you think is the right answer. 
and, and showing the students what learning is when one makes a mistake versus checking a correct answer is much more valuable to me as a teacher. So I communicate that every time to my students. They have to make mistakes because then you can see the learning. You can see your learning. So the question then is, so what? What are we doing things for? Do we ask that question every time when we do teaching, when we do research? And the three basic skills that I mentioned, reflection, doing things together, practical knowing, knowing the context, looking at the interdisciplinarity, inter-perspective -perspe of a particular situation is the kind of knowledge that we need right now in a new economy, in a knowledge-based economy, where in six months' time or in two months' time, Nokia produces 20 cell phones. The cell phone that you have will not be useful anymore in about a month's time. There will be a new one. That is how fast knowledge is being produced. And if we don't, and I believe if there is no scholar practitioner model, a creative way of doing things and producing knowledge, then we will not benefit from this kind of world, the globalized world that we live in. So thank you very much, Father David, for being with us and making us reflect about ourselves as scholars and as teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santa Maria. The floor is now open for questions, so should you desire to voice your questions, kindly approach the microphones stationed near you, so they're located at the left most aisle and the right most aisle. So, just before someone asks a question, just a few announcements. First, for the RBRC of the faculty and our guests from other universities, Merienda is available at the St. Asal Hall Conference of the MP, and there will be participants from Seaburn which will usher you to the dining area. Second, after the closing remarks, we are inviting everyone to take pictures with us with Dr. Gone. So, are there people who will ask questions? Can you say their name in your organization that you're representing or the class you are in? I'm Andrew Dixman from the team of the team. Thank you for all. So, um, the thing that I got from the office of the team is like a philosophy of practicing knowledge, like learning from the things. Is that am I correct or am I? Like uh, instead of instead of uh, trying to assume stuff, we would we would it's more correct to just do it. Then whatever comes out of that um, situation, you learn from it. Then you do another thing. Then you keep on doing it until you get the right thing. Something like that. That's, that's what you're asking me, is it? Yes. Okay, well I wouldn't recommend people just doing something wild just to see if it works. Yeah, I mean, I would expect people to have an intelligent reason for doing what they're doing. Now, whether that turns out not to work properly or to be a mistake, well, that's okay. So I'm not advocating, well, we just try this for fun. I mean, and like I'll, I'll step off this cliff to see if uh, the air works and I won't <laughs> break my leg or can break my neck or something. I think risks have to be weighed. But picking up what Dr. Santa Maria said, we're not talking about being paralyzed because we're talking so much. Uh, like, do, weigh, like, do weigh up what it is you're thinking of doing. Yes. Yeah. Like, like for example, if a certain company would like to explore in another field of, like in another market, like in another group of uh, individuals who would 
uh, which is small, like like say instead of using basketball as a market, go for another sport, which the brand is not going for. Uh, what, 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 what would be your uh, take on that? Like I said, it's totally different. You still have to do the research. You have to do the research on the options. There's no, there's no, there are choices. The choices that they made have to be made, have to be based on a judgment that this is a good thing to do. And that judgment that it's a good thing to do has to be based on an intelligent understanding of the context and the situation and the possibilities and so on. So it's the same point really. Yeah, just, companies just don't hop into new markets because they feel like it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Next question, please. Approach the leftmost uh, microphone or the one located okay, the rightmost part of this auditorium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Kaltan. Good afternoon, Dr. Santa Maria. I'm John and Lynn from St. Scholastica's College, Manila, and I'm a high school teacher. We are really encouraged to do action research in our institution. However, the problem that we're always faced with and the complaint that we always have to address is we do not have time to do research. I just, I'm just very curious as to what is your personal stand regarding proposals or advocacies that universities will have a separate research faculty from the teaching faculty. Meaning, teachers who will belong in the stream of research faculty are just really meant to do research and they're not given any teaching load so that they can really produce researches for the universities. Okay, I think you're, the issue that you, scenario that you described exemplifies exactly the issue I'm trying to address. In other words, the world of theory and the world of practice have moved very far away from each other. And therefore, if you're a researcher, you don't practice. Because if research wasn't practice, of course. And that the research is going to create theoretical knowledge. Which, of course, the question is, is it of any use to anyone? But teaching is an active profession. It's a profession of action. It's a profession of being in a relationship with young people, with children of whatever age they are, and working with them to enable them to learn. So it's an active profession. So why? Is it that research is seen other than the engagement of what is the core of what the profession is about? So I would humbly suggest that the thinking behind the scenario best is misguided. And that the real research, the best research you can do, is the research that comes out of your practice. Now, as to your first question, which you just threw in as a little aside, which is about time. If you do research out of your own practice, and you bring an inquiring approach to your practice, then you're researching it as you teach. Now, you may also need to put in time to write up notes or reflections or whatever, but your actual teaching day is a day of research in action, rather than research being something that you then kind of process statistics or something about something. But see your life as, uh, there's a good friend of mine in the UK, who has written a really good article called, and this sort of caption really, Living Life is Inquiry. I think that's what, for me, that's about. So the time, if you're teaching all day, well then that's your, that's your life of research. I see my life as a life of research. Not that I write all that be everything that I do, but I'm constantly attending to what's going on in some way to try and understand more about what I do, how I do it, and so on. So hang in there and go for it. And don't mind these people who see research as something else. Next question, please. May I just, while people are thinking, just pick up something, two things really Dr. Santa Maria said. In one of the origins, not the only origin, but one particular thread 
an origin of, of action research that comes through the OD stream is uh, Lewin's great, Kurt Levine's great work in Ohio in the 1930s, where they were trying to change food eating habits. And uh, anyway, I'm going to into all that. But basically, they had two groups. One, they gave lectures on nutrition, because they were trying to get people, during the Second World War, they were trying to, and they get, because of the scarcity of meat, they were trying to get people to eat liver and kidneys and brain, which of course the tradition of Midwestern being second class meat. And uh, a mother would not put that on the table and so on. So they were trying to change the, the habits. But basically they had two groups. One they gave lectures to on the nu nutrition of kidneys and all these kind of meats. And in the second group they sat and talked in discussion about the problems they had in bringing that kind of meat to their families and what their sons would say and so on. When they brought them all back eight months later, there was practically no change in habits and behavior by the group that had got the lectures. Which is a nominous thing to say in university. Lectures and theory was changed nothing. Whereas the, it was the engagement of the people in the issues as they saw them and their exploration of the issues and their reflection of what was going on, that's where the changes took. That is a seminal research that is the, one of the foundations of action research. And I'm thinking it's very much, rather than giving lectures on bullying, that you get people to actually talk about what it's like to be bullied and to develop their own support systems and strategies for dealing with that uh, would actually be far more powerful and similar to your, your, your uh, other example of the uh, ecosystem and so on. And I would add one, i change your question. Your question was, what are we doing these things for? I changed that question. Who are we doing these things for? I'd like to pursue at that point, but I'd like to address my question to Dr. Santa Maria. Um, in our university, we give premium to publications. But uh, if we adopt a national research approach, should we not rethink our incentive system, our reward system? So that if we're able to do research that helps a community or a company, even if it does not get published, maybe this should be given some kind of recognition as well. Okay, my boss is in the audience. <laughs> Our boss. <laughs> Our boss. <laughs> and I see some people pretending that they're clapping. Okay, let's give them another story. We met the STC people. Uh, those who are now going to be integrated into our university, one university, about research. We wanted them to participate in the research activities of in our side of the world. And one particular person, one particular faculty was very strong about it because they never had that kind of that kind of uh, demand in their life that they should be producing research and public publishing. So they were saying, I'm helping the, she, she was saying, to try to paraphrase what she, she communicated very strongly, I am doing and advocating, uh, uh, I do work for the poor. I alleviate poverty. I do things to alleviate poverty. Don't you recognize that? And without trying to reenact the whole <laughs> Don't you don't you uh, realize that? Why do you want me to publish when I am already doing my job? And then, of course, I said, me, in my position, I think we should be able to understand that we are producing knowledge through practice. And that is it. So I told her, Friere Lederach, Friere. If we did not know their ideas, we wouldn't have, we are not so much involved about our engagement with community. But they wrote their ideas. So I told her, right, if you think you're doing wonderful, something wonderful, don't wash it away. It's still valuable knowledge. The question that I'm raising right now is what is this form of knowledge that we should now produce through a 
action being practitioners. Because we can now make a decision, each one of us. I am going to be a researcher practitioner. I am going to make a difference. I'm going to make, and then she was saying, I'm making a difference. Then show it for heaven's sakes. Write it down. Because who else will know about it? You will be the next leather rock. You will be the next fire. Don't waste it. And that is what we advocate as a research university. We are creating and producing knowledge. So should we publish or not? We have to publish. We have to write about this knowledge. So she also says, but we are oral, I know what's this? We talk, we don't write. So start, start talking. Let somebody document it so that it can become published. <laughs> because we are now in a non, you know, we are now in information technology. Just while you're going to my just to add to that, some of the systems, I think in the UK for example, these uh, scholar assessment systems and ranking of universities based on age earns and all that kind of stuff. One of the things they've added recently is the, as a criterion, is impact. Now they haven't defined what impact is, and there's obviously all sorts of controversies about what impact is. But actually having impact as one of your qualities of scholarship is, uh, is worth it. It's something that's valuable. I would also say, if you're not a writer, then make a video. I examine PhDs with DVDs and videos in them. You know, why should we be, in today's world, as you're saying, technological world, why should we be confined to essentially what is an outdated mode, i.e. the book? There's lots of richness there. Sorry, I interrupted you. But you partly answered my concern, the High Impact Journal. Yes, I do agree with Dr. Santa Maria that we must publish so that our knowledge will get to know by other people, whether in print or in video. What I, we are trying to, I think what Raymond is trying to ask is the High Impact Journal, the, the High Impact Journal requirement, the ISI, so where can we start where we could encourage, especially our SCC people, that we don't get to be afraid to publish because our requirement is that high, such as we know we understand the impact, the high impact journal requirement, just like what Dr. Kaufman has mentioned. But for those beginning to just begin to appreciate research, how can we encourage teachers to embrace this culture. I don't know who would answer, Dr. Goldman or Dr. Zetanemu. The one, when we met, at least to my point of view, when we asked the uh, science and technology and global complex to come and get involved, uh, we, I had in mind, it's not so much for them to publish so that they can have publication. They just brought it up. It's just so that they may be able to engage in research. And that is uh, the whole activity, the whole exciting activity of doing research. And then uh, your question is high impact. Why do we have to, to publish high impact? I'll tell you this another story of another uh, a colleague of mine who just came from the National University of Australia. He, she, he came here to do some incubation sessions with us in the faculty. We presented him our papers, and then he told us, if you want journal, uh, A journals, do your research this way. He practically redesigned every paper in terms of several studies in one paper because the argument is theoretical. Your argument is theoretical. It's not an empirical. No, you just have to empirically demonstrate the theoretical argument. So, and then he said, he went on and asked, and then he says, a journal, a journal. 
is what you do one day journal, not one for this journal. But if you want an age journal, do it this way. And then he said, eventually, why do you have to publish an age journal? You just have to publish once and you are now in the community. You have produced knowledge. So if you do not, and you are, you are now recognized as a knowledge producer because you have demonstrated rigor. Yeah, the, and the scientific requirements for what is to be acceptable as knowledge and what is not acceptable. So that, that's this reason. Now, I know it's a difficult task. I know it's a difficult task, but yeah, we just have to do it. I, what a stupid answer, but it's how? It's difficult, I'm having a difficult time writing 24 hours and eight hours a day, you know, and then revising again after, you know, because it doesn't make sense what I'm saying. So then that's the, Each one of us in the research university should aim for that. We have to help each other to achieve And I would have a totally counterposition. <laughs> I think that person from Australia National Guard exemplifies the sterility of a lot of contemporary management and organizational publishing. I don't read a journals. By and large, they're irrelevant for me. Practitioners don't read a journals. And for me, the knowledge, and that's part of what I'm, I'm being provocative, really. I'm not saying it's either or. And I would hope that we can do both in both in institutions. We can do both. But basically, the position I'm underpinning in my paper today is that, by and large, practice is neglected. It's ignored. It's not real knowledge. And therefore, I'm comforting. I would have, I spent some time in the Australian National University, and there was absolutely nothing of the kind of work I do there. And they got locked they got locked themselves into kind of ranking a journals, trying to compete with all the big universities in the world. And of course they haven't a hope. So I, I really have no time for this age around stuff. Who reads it? Who is who's and I think well, when I referred to impact, I wasn't referring to impact in an age journal where you know three hundred people read it and therefore it's a it's a high impact. It's whose life you change. What practice do you change? And by and large, theoretical journalists don't aim to do that. So I would have, if this person from Australia was here, I'd have a good argument for them. But I do not agree with this position. And, and the, my difficulty is not so much with this position, but that position is the dominant one in the academy. And there's a lack of pluralism and eclecticism saying that actually any university needs different types of research. And if you exclude practice, Certainly, we don't want to exclude uh, the high quality knowledge production that goes with day journeys and so on. But we don't want to exclude the practice and work of practitioners as well. And a lot of these universities do. It's not real knowledge. Why? Because it's practically known. And that was cut out by Descartes and those people out there. One last question. I am a uh, part time academic and a full time practitioner. And in the organization I belong to, uh, we have evolved over the years into something quite comfortable, the structure that uh, we are comfortable with, although we've had some um, trips ups and uh, stumbles along the way. Now, if one were to start an actual research project in that organization, uh, how would they go about it when most of the action has already been done, even without the help of any researcher. Well, you don't do action research simply because you want to do action research. I mean, there has to be an issue that you, you're concerned about, whether there's a problem or something. So you don't do action research on life in general. There has to be some kind of focus. So if your organization has done everything and is the perfect organization and there's no challenges and it's always fine, fine. But if there's an issue that you want to change, or someone wants to change, or there has to be, you want to have some kind of improvement or development, 
then you can do actual research as a focus. But actual research has to have some goal or some focus and inquiry. Uh, so that there's action, the action is directed towards something. But that's my point. There was an issue. There were problems in the past, but it had largely been resolved through actions by the practitioners themselves without any research uh, 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 intentions. Can we do that? Can we, can we review uh, what has been done? Sure. And can that be an action research project? Yes, there's a whole process called learning history where you develop, look at the learning and the processing of the learning becomes an intervention in the present and evokes all sorts of thoughts and reactions and different perspectives and so on. It could be a rich shared inquiry in the present tense by building on the past. Sure. Yeah. Literature on that, I'd say. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's great that you work in the perfect organization. I'm delighted. Thank you very much. We're now closing we'll the board for questions. Now I would like to invite Dr. Jean Santiago, Dr. Ben Tihanki, and Dr. Raymond Abraras to give a certificate of appreciation to Dr. David Coffin. Okay, uh, the RDR College of Business and the Center for Business Research and Development and MOD presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. David Coughlin for generously sharing his time and expertise during the public lecture titled Developing the Scholar Practitioner. Signed, uh, Dr. Raymond Abrada, Director, CBRD, and Dr. Benito Tihanki, Chair, Management and Organization Department. Good afternoon, colleagues, students, guests, Father David. Uh, first of all, the main thing that comes to mind from your talk is that uh, it seems the LSU has changed quite a lot uh, since my student days back in the 20th century. Uh, back then, of course, I always got the sense that knowledge was a static entity which came in textbooks, neatly packaged, and you basically went through a trimester mastering material which would probably remain the same for years to come. And I think uh, one of the key lessons that our students can take away from today's talk and from your extended stay in the Philippines is that knowledge is organic. It's something which evolves over time and which, if we do our jobs properly, we can actually participate in this global discourse and contribute to this exchange of ideas and uh, thus become more of a research university in our next 100 years. That definitely is a tall order for our team, Dr. Santa Maria, of course, is the director of URCO, and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Abaradas is head of CBER. And I think his idea of having a series of talks like this over the course of the school year really is essential to keep the knowledge creation and the knowledge exchange rooted in the ultimate beneficiaries because the knowledge only means anything if it's shared with an audience, whether it's in writing, orally, or through modern media. I think that is uh, the main lesson to take away from today's event. Thank you very much. I wish you all a pleasant afternoon. concludes our secret lecture for today. So we're now inviting everyone for the picture taking. So for the picture taking, we'll do this by batch, so it will be smooth and flow. We would like first to invite the RBR COB faculty to take a picture with Dr. Dr. Yeah.
guys at the universities. Thank you. 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 Thank you.